Hi folks, welcome back to our new user training videos. Today we are going to be talking about materials and materials handling. So there's a few real keys to success with uh, 3D printing uh, related to materials. First, in order to get great prints, you need to be using high quality materials. In order to get great prints, you also need to be using proper material handling. And finally, picking the right material for your application is important. This is even more true if you are using 3D printing in something beyond a form and fit prototype uh, function. So if you're going to take a 3D printed part and put it in the field, or you're going to take a 3D printed part and use it as a manufacturing tool or something, it's even more critical that you understand the material properties and the um, performance characteristics you're after in your finished part. So picking the right material. First, please only use materials on our certified materials list. We, this is a list we publish that contains every single material we've tested and approved for use on our printers. There are a few advantages to doing this. First, the profiles for all these materials are already made and they're already loaded in our slicer. This means you don't have to do a bunch of work building profiles and getting these materials to run correctly. It's just going to work correctly out of the box. If a material is listed on our certified materials list, you have an assurance that it's a good quality material and it's going to work okay. And finally, using these materials keeps your warranty in force. Our certified materials list provides information on difficulty rating in terms of how difficult to use is the material, what print surface you need to be using, what print surface coating you should be using, and then finally, what slicer profile you should be using. One final note, some materials not listed on this list may run okay, but we cannot guarantee their performance. In particular, a lot of budget PLAs and other um, low-cost materials, they may run fine, but we can't guarantee that and we certainly don't recommend you using them. Here's a look at our certified materials list. Now this is actually the spreadsheet that we build from, it's not the PDF, but it'll work for our example here. So as an example, let's say you want to run atomic filaments ABS. So you're in the ABS family category, you look for atomic filament here, and you read across. Our print surface that's recommended is glass. We should be using three layers of glue stick. We consider this an easy material to use. Here are the, the printers that material is compatible with. And then finally, for 410 and Edge, here's the, AB or here's the profile you need to be using in F3 Slicer, which is just the ABS family profile. Let's talk about picking the right material for your application. There's a few different considerations here. First is the temperature range the part's going to be exposed to. Second is mechanical load. This has a few subcomponents. Uh, if you've got a constant load like a clamping force, if you've got impacts, shocks, or other sharp abrupt loads, those are all different kinds of mechanical loading and they need to be treated differently. For example, uh, nylon is a fantastically strong material, but it is not good when subjected to steady loads because it does something called cold creep where over time that part is going to relax and then your, for example, your clamp is no longer going to clamp because it's going to be loose again. Next is, env is environmental exposure, so ultraviolet, chemicals, uh, things like that. So for example, if you're going to put a part outside, ABS is probably not a good choice because it's sensitive to UV. In that case, if the other properties of ABS in terms of strength and uh, impact resistance are what you need, ASA may be a better choice because that's a UV resistant uh, material that has very similar properties to ABS. Finally, one thing to keep in mind is if you're trying to duplicate the performance of a non-3D printed part, uh, that's going to impact your material selection as well. So for example, if you've got a part that is eventually going to be injection molded or machined, but you want to prototype with a printed part, you may want to consider that when you're picking the right material, because 3D printed parts are built differently than, even if your geometry is the same, it's going to have a different um, different structure than an injection molded part, for example. Storage and drying. So our goal when storing materials is to avoid dust and avoid moisture. At minimum, materials should be stored in resealable plastic bags with a desiccant pack. Better is to get a plastic tub with a gasket lid and rechargeable desiccant packs that you can dry out and reuse. The best tactic for storing materials 
is to store them in plastic tubs but also dry the material at about 130 Fahrenheit for 24 hours before you use them. Why do we care about all this? All thermoplastics, regardless of type, all thermoplastics absorb moisture from the air. We have to get this moisture out for the best performance. Uh, because what happens is if you melt a material that's full of moisture, that water boils out of the material and it causes all sorts of print quality issues because effectively what you've done is you've got uh, voids and bubbles of uh, moisture which turns into vapor when it's being printed in your flow of plastic. There's a few different types or a few different characteristics that can make a material more sensitive to this. Um, one is if it's a higher temperature material such as polycarbonate. If it's got fiber fill, carbon fiber, or glass fiber, that is makes it more prone to absorbing moisture. And finally, the higher your flow rate. So the flow rate is how fast we're melting and extruding the liquid plastic. The higher the flow rate, the more sensitive um, the material is going to be. So for example, if you've got a roll of ABS and you've left it out for a week, that may print fine with a 0.4 nozzle, but if you go to a 0.8 nozzle, you may find a bunch of moisture in it because it's being run harder with that higher um, or with that larger nozzle. The filament bay on edge is not suitable for long-term filament storage. It's not airtight and it's not designed to remove moisture um, once the plastic has absorbed it. Now we have an accessory that goes in the filament bay that is a dryer or dehumidifier that will slow down the rate of absorption but it will not reverse that moisture absorption. The best solution that we recommend is a standalone filament dryer oven or a low temperature oven. The one in the picture is from Binder and that will store, as you can see, quite a few spools of material and you can configure the temperature to be whatever you need it to be. So that's really our recommendation, um, especially if you are printing a lot of polycarbonates or ABS or if you're in an environment with poor environmental control, like if it's not air conditioned, you're really going to need a solution like this. So how do you know if your filament's wet? During printing, you're going to see a few things. You're going to hear spitting or snapping sounds during extrusion. These are particularly evident during the load filament phase. You may see a very small amount of steam coming out of the print head as well. Finally, if you look at that free air extrusion, you may see bubbles or voids in the extruded plastic. In finished parts, you'll see dramatically diminished part strength. You'll see, leak. You'll see weak layer bonds and you'll see poor surface finish. Let's talk for a second about carbon fiber and glass fiber filled materials. These are high performance materials and they have some really excellent uh, properties, but they do have some wrinkles to them. For one, as I already mentioned, they're more sensitive to moisture. They're also going to have higher wear rates on some of your consumable items, such as your Bowden tube or your extruder inlet guide. Um, that's because they are abrasive in nature. Uh, a side note, this also applies to glow-in-the-dark materials. So if you have a glow-in-the-dark PLA or a glow-in-the-dark ABS, treat it like a carbon fiber material in terms of abrasiveness. Finally, some brands, you may see jamming issues with 0.4 millimeter nozzles. This is due to the particulate size and how much particulate is in the material. Um, typically, you'll see this with higher um, fill percentages, like 30% fiber fill or higher. The solution here is to go to a 0.6 nozzle if your part geometry allows it. Let's talk about flexible filaments for a minute. These are for expert users only, and we have a few tips to make these easier to use. First, we really recommend you stay with 90A shore hardness or higher because they're just much easier to work with. Not all part geometries are going to be suitable for flexible filaments. You may encounter some prints that just don't work. Be prepared for a lot of trial and error. You may experience a lot of print failures until you figure out the right settings and the right workflow to get it to work consistently. Our favorite flexible is Ninja Tech, well, excuse me, Ninja Tech Cheetah. This is the one that works most consistently for us and it's uh, just the easiest to use. Over on the right hand side, we have some detailed tips and tricks to get flexibles to run more consistently.